going to talk about uh, benchmarking today. Do you hear me? Do you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm Benoît Alloz. I'm a student uh, in Belgium here in Louvain-la-Neuve, and uh, I'm an MRI and Ruby committer, and I'm most interested in anything which is benchmark related. So the talk will be in two parts. The first part will be about how to benchmark in general, and the second one will be about the tool I develop, which is called Perfer. So first, a little context. The, I made this tool last year during the Google Summer of Code, and uh, the proposal was named a complete benchmark tool and suite for Ruby implementation and libraries. And so you have, the, you have here the links, and Perfer is the tool, and Ruby Bench is the suite. It's a very ambitious project because uh, having a real good and uh, suit for every implementation is something which is very hard. But we already started it and we have already some quite interesting results. So my motivation in doing this is automated benchmarking is something very uncommon in Ruby. Almost nobody does that. And it's very important though. It's like when you, when you look at an interpreter, you want to look like, oh, this performance degrades. We tried its optimization, but it slowed this down. You would like to know it. And currently, no implementation does that, or very, very little. Also, current tools provide the basic, like, yeah, I want to benchmark a block of code and know how much time it takes. OK, you can do that. But it's not reliable. It's not stable. You benchmark it to once, and it takes one second. And the second time, it takes two seconds. You would like to know why. You would like to have this to be you can reliable, so you can do it again. And finally, Ruby is a very dynamic language, so it's much harder to benchmark than C. It's not all, uh, all uh, deterministic. So the thing that m the first thing that matters about benchmarking is factors. So there are different factors, like for example, if the implementation has a GIT or not. It affects a lot how you do the benchmark. You may have memory or garbage collector concerns. The code loaded change things a lot, especially on MRI, and the context, that is either the scope, like within the program, or the execution context within the operating system, like are there other programs running, and do they affect the running program? So I'll begin with some graph. So here, it's the performance of date time STRP time. So that's a standard method to pass time. At that time, it was in every implementation implemented in Ruby. So it's a lot of Ruby code. And so it optimizes a lot through, uh, through time. So the first iteration is very slow. It takes like more than 10 milliseconds. And then the last one are very fast. But it takes about more than 10 seconds to stabilize. So when you benchmark code, what do you want to know? Do you want to know the first iteration? And like, OK, it's very slow in Ruby. It takes like 12 milliseconds. Or do you want to know the last one? So it's very important to detect that. If we take a look deeper, we see it's not stable enough. And it's quite hard to detect when it's really stable. Like at 7 seconds, we could believe it's stable, but it's not yet. The GVM is still optimizing some things. If you look at Ruby news, it's getting stable sooner. But still, the first iteration are wrong. They are, the cache is not good, and uh, we need to optimize things. In MRI, you see much less this effect because there is no GIT. But if you look again, you see it changing a bit, although quite, quite stable. So the, my second factor is memory GC and loading code. So here is the factorial 5,000. The factorial 5,000 is a very big number. So this benchmark is just creating, multiplying big numbers. So it's very memory intensive and CPU. And so you would expect it to take the same time whether you have rails, for example, loaded or not. But it does not at all. Because the GC for here in MRI takes a very big amount of time. Like if you have loaded rails, it's twice slower. Like if, you t if it took one second to run the factorial, no, it takes two seconds. Why? Because the GC takes all the time. But that's an old story. No, in the development version of MRI, we have a generational GC, which would solve that. So that's the current situation. And so we see the orange bar is the total time, 
and the GC time is the orange, uh, the dark orange bar. And so we clearly see it's the GC, which impacts everything. So if we look now in 2.1, it's magical. We don't have all these problems. So this is a very nice speed up. It's a bit, uh, it's a bit extreme here because it's a very intensive memory benchmark, but you should see it in your apps too. So what happens when you load Rails, you load a lot of objects which stay around because they are in constant or global variable or whatever. Most of them are strings. And now with the general child GC, Ruby can detect very quickly that, OK, this object will stay forever. So I don't need to check every time if they're still alive. They will stay alive for quite some time. I only check them like one in 100 GC. So that's a big improvement. But there's something in other implementation you have much less impact, like in Ruby and MRI, we have general child GC already. And finally, the last factor is context. So the scope, so that's, for example, a static method versus a dynamic method is very different. A static method will always be faster because you don't use all the context and the, of the other outer variables. But it's also less powerful. Blocks are closure. And if you didn't have block in Ruby, it wouldn't be Ruby. So it's always a trade-off. And the other factor, finally, is uh, the outer context. So if you have like Firefox running and then you do a benchmark, then it's probably wrong to do it at that time. But you have measure against that. So when we want to measure, we want to measure two things. We want to measure time and memory. So if we do the, the simple time.now, like benchmark.realtime does, then we have mic, mic, one microsecond to one millisecond precision. On Windows, you, on Windows, you get only one millisecond precision. That's horrible. It's very hard to do a benchmark with that. If you do iTime, so it's a gem specialized in that, which take like the, the most precise clock on your available operating system, then you get about one microsecond precision. The problem is if you want to benchmark something which is very fast, like an instant variable access, or like multiplication on fixed names. This is almost impossible to benchmark, but sometimes you want very small operation. Often, when you do just call a method, it doesn't take one second. That would be a very big problem. So you want to repeat that code. But to repeat that code, you have to have hypothesis. And uh, the most important one is that code doesn't have side effect. That means when I repeat this code again, it doesn't change anything. I can still run, and the state is the same. And so if we, if we take this approach, we could, instead of just yielding a block of code, which has a huge overhead of 100 nanoseconds, we could repeat the, time, the code 100 times. And then we, we get something like an overhead of 1 nanosecond, which is quite OK. Because this, this uh, overhead, of course, adds to the error. And then your, your measurements are less precise and have a, more, a bigger margin of error. You may wonder at what time. Before, time.no is obviously real time. And then i times is a bit smarter than that. So it uses monotonic time. Monotonic time is almost real time, except when your uh, system clock change, that time doesn't change. Which is a good thing, because NTP can change your, syst your system time at any time. And so, for example, if you just set yourself your system time to the 70s, then you get negative al amounts of time. So always use monotonic time over real time. And there's even a better clock, which is process CPU time, which is the sum of the user and the system time. The slight problem is that it's usually it's a bit less accurate than the real time, but you don't need that precision or that accuracy. On the other end, the process CPU time is something you do not feel. As users, we feel like the real time it takes. But if the operation like, is, do, is done in parallel or so, yeah, real time, we say, OK, it only to take one second. <coughs> but process CPU time might be two, because there are two processes running concurrently. So it's, again, a trade-off between what the user feels is and what the real performance of the VM is behind it. So to solve this problem, because we only had time.now, which was only a real-time clock, uh, in MRI 2.1, there was we added uh, two methods, which is clock get time and clock get res. So clock get time is to get a time with a specific clock, and get res is for the resolution of the clock. 
I think it's very important, and for now it's implemented, uh, of course, on Linux and on OS 6, and soon it will be on Windows. So what, what could be the problem of using real-time? This is a picture of the CRuby Bench CI. And so this is calculating uh, Fibonacci of uh, 35, I think. And it's a cross-release of MRI. So that was uh, back like a couple years ago, and that's now. The problem is you don't see anything on this graph. It's, w it's very much a lot. And why does it? It does because it's real time and it's actually computed with the time program in Unix. So it's author of the Ruby VM. And that's not stable because, again, if you have any other application running around, it changes the time. So that's the actual Fibonacci benchmark. So it's very simple, it's implemented recursively. It's all fixed num, so it does no allocation. It's just uh, very simple and intensive. So you might not believe me when I say that these clocks are better, They're like the monotic clock or the process clock. So let's take an example. So that's the same benchmark again. And I'm just reporting a couple of things. And so if I run it, I run it 10 times. And for example, here I run it with real time. I'd see it's almost stable. Like it's always around 110. The median is 110. And I have like 3% error on the, uh, with this arrangement, which is OK. But we would like to know what happens if suddenly a script run on, on my laptop. So I launch it. Here I, I launch a, a while loop, an infinite loop. And then we see the term jump to like 180. So that's, that's problematic. Now, what will be my error margin? And we see it's huge, it's 40%. And so that's what we saw in, this, uh, in that graph. Clearly, this is the, the same effect. So if we use instead the CPU time, of course, if we don't run anything around, we see almost the same result, although it looks even more stable right now. So it's pretty clear, I think. And if we know we launch again this while loop, then we see it's totally unaffected. Although we feel it takes twice, uh, two seconds to do it. But the time we report it is the time of that process exclusively, and it doesn't account for other processes. Well, that's, I think, something everyone should care about. It's to not take always the real time, except, for example, if you want, like, I want to know how much it takes to do this HTTP request as a user. But if you want to know, OK, how fast is my VM, how fast is that Ruby, then you shouldn't take the real time, most often. If we now look about memory, there are many ways to measure memory, but memory, but the only portable way is using PS and the equivalent on Windows. And uh, it's not an easy problem to measure memory. It's much harder than time, actually. We can't measure between each iteration because each iteration are very fast. It would introduce a lot of overhead. We could do a before or after a set of iteration, or we could have a thread pooling for the memory usage. But we are not, it's very hard to have useful thing about that. So the, a good usage of memory right now is to use the GC statistic, which is internal to each implementation and tells a lot more than just the global memory. It could also be useful to detect swapping, like if I don't have enough free memory, then uh, it's a problem to run a benchmark. So not that we have our measurement, we would, li would like to analyze them. And uh, sorry for this little statistic course, but I think statistic is the way to analyze them automatically and to take error into account, which is something we never see in the Ruby community, or maybe I'm blind, but we never see a benchmark and it say, okay, I have this error. It's so important. Sometimes, like we just saw, the error is like 50%. So, but your benchmark probably cannot say anything useful about it. And it can also be used to know when the steady state is switched. Like in the first picture, when uh, I show Ruby uh, is doing with uh, just in time, then with statistic we can know. Okay, now it varies much less. We can really take good measurement. 
So if we look at the distribution, like could we apply some probabilistic law to, to do that uh, cleverly? It might look like a normal, except it has always a very long trail at the right. It has always like measurement which take much longer because of external factors. It doesn't look so much like a normal law. So we cannot really apply a probabilistic law to this. We just must rely on statistics. So one thing we want is say, okay, I don't want 10 measurements. That's, that's the whole problem. Like we saw the data, and it's like, how do I interpret that? I want one measurement and one error. And so to have that measurement, we could take the mean or the median. Usually people take the mean, but the mean doesn't represent anything. If we have an outlier, like here, at a 1065, then the mean is some data which maybe happened only one in the set of 10. If you take the median, it's like the most representative number. It's much more telling than the mean. And if we want to measure the error, we want a, a measure of dispersion. So people usually pick the standard deviation, but the standard deviation, the only thing that about everyone knows is like three standard deviation is about the error when you have a normal low. But what if you don't have a normal low? Then it doesn't tell you anything. And it goes crazy. Every time you have an outlier, it jumps and you are all like 100%, but no, just one outlier, it's okay. So you have ordered the measure of dispersion, and one will, uh, one that's interesting is the median absolute deviation. So it's the, de the deviation of the median, and then we take the median of that. So we take the most representative error, that is the distance between the median and the particular point. So with that, with the median absolute deviation, we can detect, for example, that 12 seconds, okay, it stopped varying, and we can stop really taking this measurement into account. It's very easy to see it. So the existing tool, we have, of course, everyone knows the benchmark library, and we can use benchmark.measure, which use, yeah, a real time, so that's the problem. And we also have a user on system time, which is more interesting, but it used a very, a very not precise measurement which is using the time tree call in C, and that's almost useless. Like this number are always so small that you, it's very hard to see anything. So the, you could use a standard library and do like I did just before, like use 10 times and then look at the result, but better to analyze them automatically. MRI has actually a benchmark suit, which is in benchmark driver. And the time is measured, as I said, with the time Unix tool, which is very imprecise for this, work, for this task. It does not work at all on Jeruby, because Jeruby like, takes like, I don't know, one second to spin up, and it takes a warm up after, and so it just measures the warm up of Jeruby every time. And it's not very stable, we saw the graph. So I don't think it's a very good suite. The, the code behind, like the Fibonacci or the factorial, is a, is a good example, it's a good benchmark, but how it is measured is very bad. There are, of course, other libraries. One that is very important, I think, is a benchmark IPS by Evan Phoenix, which is, takes the iteration benchmark approach. So instead of just measuring one, co one code block, we say, okay, we, re we repeat this code like 100 times, and we, we make an average, and we say, okay, it took about that time to run once. Sometimes it's, it's much more easy to interpret. So I'm not, uh, I'm not going to talk about my tool, Perfer, and how it measures reports, compare, and so on. So in the Perfer vocabulary, I try to, to use something which is similar to like the testing vocabulary. So we have a benchmark suit, and between that we have a session which is like a, a describe book in, a, in our spec. And then we have a job, which is just like one benchmark, one block of code. And we have two benchmark type, which is the iterative one, and the input size. So for example, if you want the performance of array sort, you could say, okay, how much time does it take to, take to sort an array of 100 elements? But you're more interested actually to how much does it take to, uh, to sort an array of n elements? Like if my array grows a lot, the, is, the, is the sorting good, or is the sorting taking like uh, n-square time? So 
So it's really two kind of benchmark types, and you can't just reduce to one. So if we look a bit at the API, we see we just, uh, for example, we, we measure here the performance of file.stat. And we could just use uh, the, a simple block. So you say session.iterate, and then you just do the code. Or you could pass a string to evaluate. The string to evaluate is not a nice approach, but it's necessary for things that are very fast. Because as we saw, the block override is quite important. And so if we look at array.sort, if we look uh, down, then we say, OK, we bench array.sort. We create our array of n elements, and then we measure the sorting. We can add a lot of metadata, and the idea there is to, have, for example, automatically generate a graph or chart out of it. And then uh, we also specify, like, OK, the, the first size of the array would, should be uh, 1,000, and then every time after it should double. So we just call prefer run. And then you say, OK, I took a session of file.stat with Jeruby, and I took 10 minus 0 of at least one second. So that's one important thing. When taking measurement, it should take at least 100 milliseconds. Under it, it's, you're just telling nothing. And then over that, I, I found that file.stat took about 7 microseconds, more or less 2.5% of error. And that's actually 140,000 iterations per second, which is pretty fast. Of course, have option there, so we can, for example, say uh, for it to be verbose, so you rarely see which measurement it takes. And all this is actually stored to disk, so you don't need to just copy past everything; it will stay, it persists. And so you have all uh, kind of useful metadata. So you have the file that was run, you have uh, the name of the session, the Ruby, of course, the command line which on the sheet, the runtime, and uh, more importantly, you have also the the Git branch and the Git commit. So the idea is when you are on your, on your library working, then you, s you can know, OK, at that commit, it had, it had that performance. And so you can reproduce it after. You also have a benchmark file section. So when the benchmark change, you are aware of it. And you say, OK, maybe I shouldn't compare these results. And then, of course, you have the data. So if we report here, we report two measurements. And we say, OK, it's pretty stable. We see twice the same thing with the same Jeruby. And we can compare them. So that's not very easy to read. But it's a box plot. And uh, it's nice because it shows the errors and something that's very unusual. And so we really see the, the measurements are consistent. Like the error bars are around the medians. They are around the big black line. And so they are consistent. See, we clearly have one implementation here, another there, and another there. But that visualization isn't telling. We want something that's more easy to read, more easy to interpret. And so uh, we could use Air, which is a statical language, but it's very heavy dependency, and like nobody knows it. We could use Image Magic and do our own, which doesn't make any sense. Or we could have like something like a JavaScript library and just generate it automat automatically on the web. And that's what I'm longing for. Uh, until recently, there was uh, almost no library uh, being able to report the error, or at least in a nice way. But it has, it's had changed recently, so it should be better now. So the visualization part is something I didn't finish yet. And so I'm still working on it. As we saw before with the MRI thing, logging code is very important. And so you can't just run all the, the statistics in the same process and the dumping to YAML, for example, on, on disk, and the measurement. You need to separate them. And so that's something I'm doing now. It's separate between the driver and the runner. So the driver could be like any Ruby, doesn't matter at all. And the runner is like for every Ruby you want to benchmark. So you say, OK, uh, Ruby 2.0, for example, you will benchmark Jeruby and Ruby and Ruby News, and it will launch each process. And this process is only load what is really necessary. So that's only a high resolution clock and uh, a very minimal API for uh, Perfer. So measuring for iteration, I think, is pretty nice. It's much more stable than any other library uh, I have seen. It might still need some tuning, of course. 
the present sense is there, and it works quite nice. But the comparison and the graphing is not yet implemented. So you, for that, for the moment, you have to interpret yourself the result. So I think this is a big time for this kind of tool, because we would like to estimate more precisely the impact of new features. Like, for example, one year ago, we, we spoke about refinements. And it was like, OK, it's about 5% slower than before. Is it acceptable? And people were like, oh, I don't care. It's like so much a big new feature. And what is 5%? Exactly, it actually was never 5%. It was like 10% for benchmark, 12 for another, 0 for one. So we'd like to have like a global picture and something that's more precise, like, OK, in some cases, it's totally unacceptable because it slows things down. Or OK, around every, every use case, it's reasonable. I want uh, the ability to compare, to compare performance meaningfully, so that's with errors I show. And so, OK, we have this number, and these are stable. And OK, I can relatively know that this number will always be that way on that particular laptop processor memory and disk. And finally, I want some continuous benchmarking in all implementation, which could help uh, regression in terms of performance. So that's it. Thank you. Do you have any questions?